Macmillan Education Caribbean. And um, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Debbie Roberts, who is our resident expert today, who's going to take us through a webinar on revision tips and techniques for secondary students. So if you have any questions at all, pop them in the chat box and Debbie will go through them as uh, as we go. And if there's any questions afterwards as well, um, we'll we can email you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. OK, so without further ado, I'm going to pass over to the wonderful Debbie. Thanks, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Good morning, Thomas. That's a very nice uh, response there in the chat box. Okay, so I really, really enjoy working with teachers. I've been out in the Caribbean a few times. And so for anyone out there that's been to any of my sessions, hello, good to be with you again. Um, and I really enjoy the interaction that we have and the sharing of good practice and the enthusiasm that we all have for teaching. So if you've got anything to share, any questions, anything at all, please, please, please use the chat box. I would rather stop the whole presentation and address something that you need to know rather than just work my whole way through it and you all go, you know, it's about you, it's for you, it's to support you. So please ask any questions, make any comments and we will be um, more than happy. So it's Teacher's Day in Jamaica. Yay! Happy Teachers Day, everyone in Jamaica. I've been to Jamaica. I have worked there in your school, so hello. And good morning to everyone else. And thank you for giving up your very, very precious time to be here for this webinar. Hopefully I'll be visiting you soon. That would be nice, wouldn't it? So what we're doing today is we are going to look at what makes a good planning session. We're actually going to look at planning revision, what revision is, we will look at some revision strategies and I'm really interested in using blended learning because blended learning is um, something that was thrust upon us. It's something I researched years ago, but it wasn't really very useful, I guess, um, because of what's happened recently with the pandemic. We have been really forced into using blended learning and you know, I've worked in teacher education for a long time and I feel so, so sorry uh, for you teachers because a trainee teacher said to me no one's no one's trained me I don't know how to do blended learning I don't know how to do remote learning I don't know how to do uh, sessions like this and I said it's okay no one does we don't know how to do this we will just help each other and it will happen so I'm really really focused on introducing and you know highlighting where blended learning can be used so sorry if I get boring with that um, because not that I'm expecting another pandemic, but uh, I think it's taught us a lot that we can actually learn remotely and we don't have to be face to face and it doesn't all have to be about the teacher. I'm an inquiry based specialist, so that that works really well for me. So let's have a look at it and unpick it a little bit more. I run a lot of revision conferences for students, so I might have a hundred students in a in a massive room and we'll have a conference about revision and we might focus it on a subject, we might just look at strategies. I also run revision uh, conferences for teachers and trainee teachers and people who are implementing revision and writing revision opportunities. And so every time I run a session, I always start with this. Now, if we were together now, you'd be shouting answers at me um, and you'd be telling me because I'd ask you, who taught you to revise? I will share with you because as teachers, we often live a very lonely life. We spend a lot of time in the classroom and we don't really do much else, do we? Um, so I will share this with you. This was one of my golden moments in education when I said, okay, it was a, bit, a big academy train, so there were lots of specialists, lots of leaders of learning. Who taught you to revise? And as usual, I got the things, no one would just expect to know it. I taught myself. And from the back, there was a, a voice that said, you did. And I looked across and there was this trainee teacher, someone who I'd taught at school. 
um, and they told me that I had I had taught him how to revise and he'd used it many, many, many times. And so that's really interesting that he'd been such a success, but it, only I had ever taught him to revise. And that's not because I'm fantastic. That's because I just happened to be interested in revision and revisions techniques. Otherwise, I would never have been aware of it. So since becoming a, a consultant, it's easy for me now because I'm the person who does all the research and you're the people that are actually in the classroom now. So I can pass on a lot more information. So what is revision? Well, I can tell you that revision is looking at lots of different strategies. That the more processing of the information that we can actually achieve through a strategy the more chance, and this is based on evidence and research, the more we process, the more, I used to have a saying, the more you use it, the less chance you'll lose it. The less you use it, you will lose it. And what that means is the more you are using that information, you will actually remember it. You'll process it. If you don't use it as much, you won't remember it as much. It orders knowledge, it puts it into some kind of logical pattern, logical sequence that, that can then be drawn upon. It is a good way to check understanding. The value of that is only if the revision starts early. Because um, if it doesn't start early, then there's absolutely nothing you can do if you find out areas of weakness or areas where the, there is some challenge. It's a good idea to consolidate information. It's a good place to consolidate and to really pin it down into the nitty gritty, the important facts, rather than looking at a massive big exercise book or folder that's full of information that's been learned over maybe two years or even longer. It, we begin to consolidate. I can tell you that revision isn't this. It's not relearning and it's not the last minute. This should be carefully planned. Revision should start as soon as we start to learn. And so we really should be revising all of the time. Most certainly, absolutely not relearning. First class, first time learning, followed by very effective revision. That's how we succeed. Notice I've evaded from saying cramming. The reason for that is cramming works for some people some of the time and that's from a very early age up until the day you stop learning whenever that might be which i'd hope is never we've recently found out that cramming actually does work for some people we can't rely on it though because it doesn't always work it seems to work intermittently so some people might leave cramming until the last day the night before oh my gosh I had a colleague at, 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 when I was a student at university she was really really bright very successful person and she left everything till the last minute she'd think nothing to leave in to set in an alarm for 2 a.m in the morning getting up and uh, completing an assignment or an essay or something. That to me, that would be horrific because I need to be planned. I need to know how everything's done. But cramming worked for her and it does work for some people. In other revision sessions that I've run, some teachers tell me that that's, how that's their preferred method of revising. Why should we rely on it? Well, what happens if that day it doesn't work for you? and then you've got nothing else. What happens if that time you've put aside to cram, you're not well? What happens if all your notes are kept on the internet and the internet's down? That's why we can't rely on it. It's great if it works for you, but I always leave it till last because I am aware of it, but I personally wouldn't recommend it. We need to tell our students to get up early, rise early, Good luck with that one. I've worked with lots and lots and lots of teenagers. And when I used to say, you need to get up early in the morning. Oh, I got, oh, I can't do that. It doesn't work for me. So good luck with that. But actually, we now know that the way that the brain works, we do absorb 
facts easier in the morning. Why? Because this front processing part of our brain is not filled up with all the technicalities that we have to get through in the morning. Have I had my breakfast? Have I got my packed lunch? Do I need my trainers today? Um, do I need a bag? Do I need that folder? By the time we've got to school, our brain at the front, the processing short-term memory is clogged really. And so the earlier you get up, the clearer your mind, you've got a better chance of absorbing that information easier. So let's make it easy. It's really important that students establish why they're revising. Notice I'm saying students all the while and not you. Revision is not your responsibility. It is the responsibility of the student. You need to guide, you need to teach them strategies. You need to tell them when it's a good time to revise. You need to remind them of the date because many students do not manage time very well. So that's your responsibility if you want your students to get good results. But actually, it's, it's theirs. They need to take ownership of their revision. So they need to know why, why are you revising? Are you revising for a test? Is it for... What kind of test is it? Is it a, an end of year? Is it a, a final test? Is it how long is the test? How many questions are there? What kind of questions are they? Are they multi-choice? Are they long answers? Are they multi-faceted, multi-part questions? Is it an essay? Is it a practical? They need to know this. By them finding out the answers to these questions, they're actually preparing themselves for the exam. And so it's all about processing information. The more they process it, the more they'll remember. Do it now. Do it now. Don't leave revision until the exam season. That won't work. Because whatever you're teaching, everyone else is teaching something that's equally important. Start revising when they learn. I observed um, a school that had adopted a technique that I wasn't very sure about when I first read about it. So what they did, they learn a topic and then whilst learning the next topic, they went back and reviewed and revised the first topic. As a scientist, that made me twitch and it made me twitch because I thought, what about the times when they're learning about cells, biological cells, and then they might move on to electricity? How confusing is that? So I actually observed a lesson with those topics in mind. And it actually what I realised was by seeing the topics together, by seeing biological cells and seeing cells in electricity, it kind of separated them, whereas I thought it had confused them. And it didn't. It pulled them apart. And they were able to see that cells mean two different things. And so it does work. It, it takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of confidence. And you need to start it early. So... I encourage primary school teachers to use this strategy so that when they get into secondary, they're already familiar with it and it's not unusual and they're not adapting a new technique while they're preparing for probably more important assessments, shall we say. It encourages children and students to review and reflect at the end of each section. In my view, if you plan to pass, you've got to prepare a revision plan. This re revision plan should be shared by all interested parties. So you need to be involved as a teacher. The parents, people at home need to be involved. Their study buddies, the people that they'll be revising with need to be involved. They need to see this plan. Why? Someone once said to me so that parents can say, you haven't done that. Now, if parents and teachers are saying to students, you haven't done that, you're behind. What does that say to the student? I'm going to fail. And that's not really very helpful, is it? What we need to say is, you've shared this plan with everyone. 
you're accountable. This gives you some accountability. I've had a look at this and I think it's doable. It doesn't clash with anything else. It's not at a time when you're playing soccer. It's not at a time when it's holiday time and you might not be in your usual environment. So I agree it. I think that's a great idea. Your parents, your carers, they all think it's it's doable, it's workable. You shared it with everyone. They will ask you. They will want to see evidence. So you've got that, you've got that accountability. Make sure students plan some break time, some chunks of time where they're relaxing. These are young people or older children. They're still children. They do need to have fun, they do need to relax, and they do need some downtime from learning. That's really important. But don't panic. Remind students, don't panic. That's our job to panic, not yours. Remind students to relax, to have a break, to space out the work over stretches of time. I'm quite old to some students i'm very old to some students i'm really old but yeah come on you know i'm a grown-up i've been working for a long time i've been taking qualifications forever i am quite addicted to education so when i'm bored i do tend to go back to university and do something else it's just the way i am but like the week before last it was a friday I'm working on three huge projects at the moment, um, one of them very exciting and I, and I hope that one day you it will help your students. But anyway, so it's really busy at the minute and I'm up against it for deadlines and things. And so I've been working 17 hour days, which is not unusual for you teachers, I do know how you work, but I've been doing that seven days a week for quite some time now. and. Um, this particular day, I was actually forcing myself to write more and more and more. You can have a break when you've written this. You can have a break when you've done that. You can't stop today until you've finished this. And it was getting really hard. I had backache. My hands were so swollen that I had to buy a new keyboard, a really, really big one with really, really big keys because my fingers were so swollen that the keyboard that I normally use, I was pressing two keys at a time. So it was really bad. I was in pain. And it got so bad that I thought, you know what, I need to stop. And normally I'd walk away and sit somewhere different, but I knew I needed to lay down. Never done that before in my life. And I went away and I laid down. And I laid down for 10 minutes, 10 minutes. And I got up and I thought, yes, here we go again, ready to go. And I thought, oh my gosh, I have just learned a very valuable lesson. Let's pass this on to our students. Take yourself away from the study area. Don't just switch your computer onto something else. Don't just pick another book up. Don't just go and sit in a different chair. Take yourself away. And that time, that invested time, will pay itself back tenfold. It really will. And I've known the research, but it wasn't till the other day that I actually put it into practice. And now it's my goal. Remove all distractions. Teenagers are very easily distracted. Teenagers tend to look for distraction and we know this through observing them. Tell them to set up an area and I know that we don't all live in mansions <laughs> but try to set up an area even if it's the corner of a room where they will not be distracted, where no one's watching TV, no one's playing on a console or some type, no one's calling you, texting you, somewhere where you're completely away from all distractions and focus, because that focus time will be valuable. Make sure you've got everything. Tell them, make sure you've got a spare pen, spare piece of paper, Make sure they've got everything that they need. Sit down and plan to revise. So what do they need to know? Okay, so I've worked with these concept maps for some time with students, especially with older students, because if you give them a folder and they pick it up, they tend to go, oh, I've got to learn all that in six weeks. 
I can't do that. Give them something like this, which is a concept map, and it literally does take up on the page about what that A5, maybe if that. Look at how much information is on there. Not much. What it does is it breaks it down into doable, doable information, and it can be digested from a glance at a glance. It's it's visual and it's graphical. So it appeals to the lots of ways that different people process information. If they prepare these themselves, they're very valuable because they've processed a lot of information to actually consolidate it into the concept map. So they're, they're already revising while they're actually gathering the information together. The downside of it is, what happens if they miss something key? We know through research and not just students, through adults as well. We tend to ignore what we find challenging. We tend to ignore the very bit that we should be revising. And that's the danger, that students will miss things, whether it be consciously or subconsciously, and it usually is the important bit. If you plan the concept maps, then yeah, they've missed out that first little bit of processing information, but they know that that concept map includes everything that they need to know. And so there's pluses and negatives to both there. You can download loads of templates for concept maps and there are lots of useful resources where you can um, access blank concept maps, lots of different types, some that just use circles, some that use different shapes like this, some are bigger, some are smaller. You can find the ones that work for you and work for your students. There are lots online, really. I did this, this I downloaded this. It's, it's easy to find. And you, as I said, you can do these or you can provide a blank one for your students, tell them the different areas, ask them to look at the learning objectives, the keywords, to help them to understand what they need to revise. They can use this as a tick box. Yep, I'm okay with that. You really okay with that? Let's look at an exam question. Right, this is really important. This is a self-checker that is from a revision guide. There are lots of revision resources out there. Find one that you trust and you can rely on and encourage students to use the same or one that suits them for whatever reason. This is a good way where students can actually look at the milestones so they're ticking off. Now, we all know that keeping lists gives us confidence. We know that psychologists tell us that if we keep lists, even as adults, and we tick things off the list on a daily basis, Charlie and I have just had a conversation about this. Our, our lists seem to get bigger and bigger, and I bet yours do as well as teachers. But these are great because students can look at those objectives that are taken from the curriculum, and they can say, yes, I'm okay with that. Maybe. No, definitely not. They can then do a bit of revision and they can go back and say, well, do you know that? No, it's now a maybe. I'm building confidence and let's applaud that. Well done. You've done so well. You've gone from, I cannot do this. Yeah. Can you see that by doing that, even if it's tiny, we're building confidence. We're increasing. Confidence is the thing that gets students through exams sometimes. Recent research that I have read tells us that when a student comes out of some kind of assessment and we say, how did you get on? As a teacher, what do you think they say? Do you think they overinflate or do you think they underinflate? I'm a really experienced teacher and I'll be honest, I thought they underinflated. I've worked with lots of students who've gone, oh miss, I can't do this. Oh, miss, I'm stupid. The terrible things I've heard students say. And I thought, no, you're not. Come on, let's get a bit of confidence. The research tells us students overinflate. They come out of an assessment. How well did you do? Fantastic. Did really well. 
Did you answer question four? I did. How well have you done overall? Oh, I didn't really well. I've passed, I know I have. And then it comes to it, we look at the exam papers and it's overinflated. So be mindful of that when you're looking at these things that are self-check. Self-checks are great, but take them with a pinch of salt, I guess. Study buddies work really well. We know that when students work with someone that they trust or feel comfortable with, and sometimes people that you force them to work with can be very successful. Why? We're pack animals. We work as a team. That's, that's genet a genetic fact for us. We work as a team. I run lots and lots and lots of different training sessions, workshops. I run lots of drop-in centres and things like that. I once was running this huge conference and I was stood at the back because I was going to be introduced by someone. I was stood at the back and when I was at the back, I was observing. These were all qualified teachers. I was observing the qualified teachers as they walked into the room. I'm sure you will have seen this. You see someone come in and they, they look around and then they see someone and they shoot off and they sit down. And I used to think, gosh, everybody knows everybody. And I once went up to um, a, a, a teacher that I'd just watched do that. And I said, do you know each other? Um, yeah, a little bit. Have you worked, do you work together? Oh no. Oh, how do you know each other? I think we were on a training course about four years ago. And I thought, gosh, they don't know each other at all, really. But what we know is, that we feel more comfortable working with people, even if we only slightly know them, and we work better and we feel more confident. So let's utilize that, set up buddy systems. It, it helps students gain confidence in the work. They work together, so they're supporting each other. There's less stress, there's less anxiety. Find people that they can work with though. How many times have, as teachers have we said, find a partner and they go with the one person that we know they will not work with. They'll have a great time and they'll enjoy themselves, but they won't work. And so be conscious of that and encourage children, students to work with someone that where, where the time will be constructive. It works well if it's someone who lives close to them, if these are students that are conscientious enough to work outside school and work towards that revision plan. They can use key vocabulary. They talk to each other. They communicate each other with each other. They can use the vocabulary in context. And so they begin to become more confident in what the words actually mean. So they're not copying definitions from a book they're actually using language. I have a big thing about this, and that's because um, I've got a master's in students who learn in English as an additional language. And what that taught me is that the way that we understand language, why is that important to me? Because modern curriculum has very, very, very complex and very, very extensive vocabulary that students really do need to understand in order to access questions in an exam and be able to answer them appropriately. And as this is a revision session, it's kind of important that they can do that. I used to keep glossaries where children used to get a, a book, an exercise book, write letters of the alphabet in it. When they came across a word, a keyword, they used to write the keyword, write their own definition. I'd collect them in and check them. Thought it was a great idea because we shouldn't, we should define our own words once we're experienced, once we understand them. And I thought that's what we were doing until I looked at the word producer. And the definition said, a person who makes TV programs. I thought, what? We were actually doing about food chains and interdependence. Clearly, they just copied that from a dictionary. What use is that? It's not useful. It's actually detrimental to learning because it then confuses why are we talking about TVs? They can test each other, they can problem solve, they can figure it out, they can work it out together and while they're doing that, they're processing information and the more they process, the more success they have because they've got better recall. 
Happy Teachers Day, Shauna. Welcome, 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 Sylvania. And that's a really good opportunity to say. Has anyone got any questions, any comments? Are you all there? Hello. Are we still with are we still in the room? Are we still all together? Any questions at all? Any comments? Anything? Please feel free to add them to the comment box, the chat box. As you can see, we won't get through this presentation. We rarely do. I'm sorry. I just um, like to pass on as much information as I possibly can. Oh, thank you, Christine. That's so kind of you. I appreciate that. It's a very lonely world sat here talking to a screen. <laughs> so I appreciate that. And thank you. Is it Nyan? Thank you. That's lovely. Great to be with you all and able to pass on comments. And as I said, you know, if we don't get through this presentation, that's absolutely fine. I teach revision conferences over weeks and weeks and weeks, not an hour. And so I you will get a copy of it or you do normally. I can't imagine why you would not. I'm sure Charlie will um, confirm that. But yeah, you usually do get a copy of this presentation. And then when you look at that, or I think there's videos online as well of it. So if you have any questions or queries, even after the event today, I'll be more than more than happy to help you out and support you. That's my job. That's my passion. This is what I do. I love supporting teachers because I am a teacher and I know how difficult it is. So study buddies, they're brilliant. I love study buddies. I often, how, how many times as teachers now do we work with someone and we ask them, what do you think? Is this a good idea? Is this likely to work? How do I get my students who are just not able to focus just to get in the study mode? Right, you know what, Christine? In my opinion, students don't get into that study mode. Do you know why? Because they think they're going to fail. So a lot of it comes down to confidence. And so what we need to do is spend some of that quality one-to-one -one time liaise with parents, carers, people at home, and explain this student is not in a good place. They are not focused. They are not into this. They've given up probably. And try to formulate something we will look at some different strategies in a minute. Remember also, lots of students don't understand what revision is. I carried out my own research and the most common answer to what is revision? Exam questions. No, no, it's not that at all. Exam questions are a big part of it, but they're not the only part. And so let's look at some of these strategies and try to get students interested. Use stimulus, use something to get them interested and want to know. Because if they start asking questions and they want to know, then you've got them. That's the core, the absolute center of inquiry-based learning is to get the student to ask why. Why does that happen? And we can do that by using stimulus for whatever subject they're doing at the time. I might have told you this story before. We were once, I was teaching about the heart, not my strong point, I can tell you. These students were very disengaged. I actually heard them coming down the corridor from, from lunchtime. That's how interested they were. So I decided as a stimulus to get a big glass crystallizing dish. I made a heart out of gelatine. And I filled it, filled the dish with ink and powder paint. Seemed like a great idea at the time. How naive could I have been? I dropped the, when I heard the noise, shocked me a little bit. I dropped the crystallizing dish. I had, uh, it was summertime in the UK, very rare. I had bare legs, flip flops, not a good idea in a science room anyway. And I dropped the crystallizing dish. It splashed all over my skin. The more I rubbed my skin, the more it became visible. The students came in, I thought, well, that's it. This lesson's a disaster. And they're, oh, Miss, what have you done? There's blood everywhere. Oh my gosh, there's blood everywhere. And there's a heart under the table. She has murdered someone. She must have, or she's killed an animal. There's blood and on it went. But at the end of the day, they wanted to know where the blood came from why there was a heart on the floor and why I was covered in blood. So already they were asking me questions about 
what led to the heart. And it was actually a brilliant lesson for a lot of students who were not engaged in education at all and seriously not interested in the human heart. But by the end of the lesson, they were. The result of that was they actually looked forward to coming to the next lesson because they thought it would be something of the same, which meant that they came into the lesson with a completely different approach to learning. Yeah, what are we doing today? What are we learning about? And yes, it was a noisy learning environment, but it was a learning environment. Don't throw blood everywhere, but think about what actually gets them interested. Teenagers, usually the more gory, the more disgusting, the better. Okay, so I've already talked a little bit about glossaries and we are rapidly rushing through this uh, webinar at the moment. I hope you're all okay out there. Um, I hope you're all getting something from this. Okay, when we're talking about definitions, I did have something. Oh, yeah, I have got something, actually. Um, this is something I used for a primary revision session the other day um, about definitions. Keywords are really important that they understand them. Um, but some students really found it difficult to write a definition or to actually understand these definitions. So I said to them, what does it mean to you? Well, it means this, this and this. And so what they actually did was make these definition plates and the, what the words mean to them. And yeah, these are primary, okay? But I think in here, I think that one was a secondary one, lower secondary. Um, we were doing about time and SI units and the importance of SI units, and they went away and made that. Um, in primary, they need to do about children and how they grow up into people that look similar or might look a bit different, growing plants. That's actually a secondary school, one lower secondary. Very simple, very primitive. But for them it's differentiated between a flowering plant and a non-flowering plant. You can just see the non-flowering plant there. They put it on an elastic and hung it in the window so that every time the breeze blew, it bounced around and they looked at it. Whatever works, whatever works. They need to eat well, we need to educate them. They cannot go into an exam. I'm nervous so I haven't eaten anything. I'm nervous so I haven't drunk anything. I'm worried that I might need to uh, use the toilet, the bathroom during the exam, so I haven't drunk anything today. No, we need to hydrate and we need to feed our brains. A banana, I used to say to my students, have you had a banana and a glass of milk? They just go, oh, mess, yeah, we get it, we get it. But at the end of the day, they used to make sure that they'd had something to eat and they were, diet they were hydrated, even though they were fed up and tired of hearing me say that. Revision cards are brilliant. You have to consolidate the information. You have to read everything. You have to read it so well that you understand it so well. And then you get it onto a revision card. These can be used like flashcards that we used to use to learn language at a much earlier age. And working with a revision buddy, they can share the making of the revision cards and they can amend them, add to them, take things away, and they can test each other with them. So whilst I was doing this, you can get, you know, the key chain, the, the key rings, you can get them punching all in the corner, thread the key chain through. Oh, yeah, as it is in the picture there. And then they can actually flick through and work through it. This is my revision card set when I was doing chemistry. I found this. I've recently moved and I actually found this. This is actually an original. <laughs> There you are. I had a kind teacher who used to print things out for me. But yeah, that's, that's... The worrying thing is it's not used very much, is it? Unlike one of my students who was doing business and computing and used these revision cards, you can see that he really did use them. He's, he's drawn diagrams and pictures that mean nothing to me because I've never studied this subject area. And then he's gone through and consolidated even further by highlighting certain parts of it, as students do. Some parts highlighted more than others. <laughs> and lots of diagrams and things that obviously would help him. I asked him the other day if I could use this on this webinar, and he said, don't be ridiculous. 
but you won't know, will they? Um, so they are really good, but just a word of caution there. They're good at consolidating information. They're good at looking at a small amount of information that for your students that are a bit disengaged, don't want to look at a massive piece of paper. They're just looking at that tiny bit. Good for that. Highlighters, okay. I've always used highlighters. I used to have, in one of these webinars, I went, oh, I've got a box of highlighters, love. And since then I've done some research some highlighters were uh, researched at a university that I worked at, so I was quite privy to some of the information. I don't think it's been published. Do you know the most common colour, which is the lemony greeny colour? Here we are. Here's a free pen that I got from a university. And on the end of the free pen is the offending colour. That is the most common colour to use and the lime greeny colour. Some research tells us that those two colours actually block the neurological pathways. And so they could actually stop the revision process. So be mindful of it. Also underlining and using other coloured pens. Some students just remember the keywords or the things that they've underlined and they don't join them together to make it mean something. And so it's a kind of this fragmented piece of information it's a good piece of information that's been chopped up so much that it actually doesn't any longer make sense so be careful and mindful of that as well and i guess the message is use a range of strategies don't use just one because if there is a problem with that you've used other things to compensate for it Post-it notes, I love post-it notes. My desk's covered in post-it notes. Look at these post-it notes, aren't they pretty? What a lovely colour. The company, it's their colour of their lo logo. So, Christine, I'm so glad you're here. It's so lovely. It's like you're in the same room as me. Uh, yeah, I'm glad. I love post-it notes. I love them for so many different reasons. This is, this is a Flickr book that I uh, borrowed from a student. Okay, and this is there. We're doing forces and machines, simple machines. So on the front there, look, there's the bit that they found difficult, the load and the force on a pulley. They didn't understand pulleys, so they've done that on their revision flicker. It's falling to pieces, look, so I've used it so many times. Um, they used the, they could never remember the fulcrum. So they drew that diagram of the lever and labelled it. Very simple, look, not much information. Also using formula triangle, couldn't quite remember that formula. And so they've written it on there. The idea is they flick it as a flicker book. It doesn't flick very well anymore because it's been used and overused. It's all creased up and falling to pieces, but there's the idea. Also sticky notes, write something on a sticky note that you found particularly difficult stick it somewhere where you will look on a regular basis again a mirror you're brushing your teeth combing your hair putting your moisturizer on you're looking at it it's almost like you're subconsciously absorbing that really 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 useful information love sticky notes but quick story even though we're running out of time i'm sorry i was in the caribbean once and i was running a session and I, the only place we could stick the sticky notes was on the window. I didn't realise how hot it was in the Caribbean. And all the sticky notes slid down the window during the session and left a litter of sticky notes all over the floor. Love this picture. I don't care that it's not secondary. I um, just love it. It just makes me smile every time I see it. So make up a silly song. This is a silly song that a student made up for me and they do sing it to a tune. It's something like, I was walking down the road and I really felt the force. Was it friction? Was it up thrust? And on it went. You get the gist of it. It's funny. It's good fun. Something that they can work with with a study buddy in the classroom. Right, mnemonics are okay, aren't they? But they don't always work. They work really well for remembering the order of the planets, for example. But... Sometimes you wonder if it's worth the effort. I guess if it's something that you're finding challenging, then it's got to be worth the effort. If it works for you, that's the key thing.
I love this. I remember teaching my own children to read using look, cover, spell, check. I don't know if you remember that, but I, I remember using this technique. This is an extension of it, really, for children that are learning much more information. So what they do is they, they put the hand over something relevant that they're revising in the textbook or the notebook, and they read as much as the hand, so they almost make a mental line, and they read as much of that information that can fit under their hand. They then recall what they've just read, and they retell it to their study buddy or their partner, their revision buddy, the person sat next to them, they cover it up with their hand, look at it like that so the other person can't read it. When they're filling the information back, not word for word, just the context of it, they then check it and say, well, you've missed this fact out, you've missed that fact out, let's try it again. The beauty of that is the student who's remembering the information is processing that information by delivering it back, they're processing it again. The person, the partner who's testing if you like they're reading the information so they're processing the information they're then listening to what the other person's saying and deciding if what they've said is actually on there or have they said everything that's important on there so they're processing and again they will hold the discussion so they're processing it again so that processing of information is increased massively pause for a second Remind students they are not alone. This is not a competition. This is a team effort. Ask them to list the people in their team. Who did they share their revision timetable with? Their teacher, their study buddy, their partner, the people at home, parents, carers, whoever they shared their revision timetable with is likely to be part of their team. It's a team effort. Remind them that they can ask for help. I'm co not coping very well with this. I'm not sleeping. I feel anxious. I'm worried. I'm nervous. Um, and remind them that, to talk to someone because we now know that lots of students are feeling very, very anxious. They always do at revision time. This year, increasingly so, I was speaking to a university student the other day and the stress, worry, anxiety that they put themselves under was unbelievable because all they kept saying was, I need to catch up, I need to catch up, I need to catch up. I said, who are you catching up to? Well, everybody else. I said, why? Because is there only you that's been in the pandemic? Is there only your school that's been closed? It's affected everyone. It's in the word, it's in the name, pandemic, it's all of us. You're not actually chasing anyone because we're all in the same position. You've got to do the best, the best for you and that's good enough. And we need to remind our students of that. Let's be kind to each other. As we said earlier, practice questions. Oh, thank you, Shauna, very kind of you. I'm glad this information is, is working for you. That's great, that's what it's all about. Practice questions, there's a time and a place for practice questions. It does help with time management. It helps with understanding what the format of the exam will look like. It builds confidence because they become more and more familiar with an exam paper, with the type of questions, with using graphs, using charts, whatever is in the exam that you will be using. But don't forget the answers. Absolutely no point in sitting. I have observed lessons where the students come in and they say exam, exam paper, exam paper, exam paper. Next lesson, they get a marked exam paper back and another exam paper. No point at all. The information, the important bit is actually going over the answers, discussing them. But why did you put that? What made you think that? You misread the question. Look, read the question again. It didn't actually ask for that. Okay, so why did you say that? Because you didn't understand it. That's the bit you need to be focusing on then. That's the bit you need to go and revise. Look, try and look at page 23. That will help you with that question in future. That's the point. That's the point of the exam questions. Now, if we were together now, I would have already said to you, 
what do you think is the most, the proven, all of the research tells us, what do you think is the most effective revision strategy? It's easy now for you to say, well, I would say quick quizzes. Yes, quick quizzes, whatever age group is the most effective, the most effective type of revision. And most students really enjoy it if it's done right. There are different ways to do it. So individuals or study buddies or groups could write a question based on a topic that you are directing. So we're all looking at mechanics this week. So you all need to write a question that's based on one of the objectives or so your team are addressing this objective, you're addressing that keyword. Write a question in your as an individual, your group, your team, with your partner. And then write the answer that you're looking for. Then look back at the question, does that really answer that question? Is that really addressing the objective, the keyword that you've been given? When you're happy, you give the question to the quiz master, which will probably be you. You tell the students to form a quiz team and they have to name their quiz team, which they have great fun doing and takes their mind off revision for a second. You then tell the teams, you will get one point, two points, whatever you decide per question that you've answered correctly, but you can't answer your own question. Okay, you ask the questions, they answer the questions, you go through the answers at the end. Okay, experienced teachers, how much have they processed that information? Wow, lots of times. They've processed it lots of times, but they're working in a non-challenging environment. What drives them? The person who asked me earlier about not being interested, what drives them? It's a competition. So although we don't want the exam to be a competition, anything that happens in the classroom generally works well if it's a competition especially if there's a prize at the end but it's not them that's competing it's their group that's competing so they've got confidence and they're not anxious because it's the team that's competing okay you lovely experienced people what happens when you ask them to give an answer and they say oh it's um it's the square root of seven is 53 uh, no, it's not. Why isn't it? Because don't dampen the argument. Oh, sorry, I'm a teacher. The debate. Let that debate run. Because while that debate for that one mark runs on, what are they doing? They're arguing about the content. <laughs> they're actually arguing about the content that they're trying to revise. I mean, don't let it go on for an hour, that's pointless. But for a few minutes, they are all engaged in getting that point. And do you know what? That point you might give them in that quick quiz could mean the difference of them doing really well in the assessment that they're preparing for. That's why quick quizzes are the top form of revision. So after they review their answers, they then decide what they need to focus on and don't forget that survey tells us they overinflate, and so they will miss out things that they should be focusing on make sure you keep upbeat well done okay you might have got seven out of ten wrong but last time you got them all wrong so well done so it doesn't matter how much progress has been made applaud it and support it and remember, the ones that are disengaged, the ones that are not interested, are the ones that are probably really anxious and not very confident, even though they don't come across like that. Okay, answer, practice answering the questions. Look for those, look for those doing words, look for those keywords. Choose, describe, suggest. I once spoke to a student, she said she didn't answer question 29. I said, why? So it said discuss. 
and the lady at the front said we couldn't speak. My fault, I didn't prepare her for a discussion question, though in my defence she wasn't my student. Okay, multiple choice questions, do they need to know them? Do they understand the process of elimination? Is that cheating? No, it's not, because they need to understand which ones to eliminate. Top tips, it's less than 40% that you got in one of these little mock exams in your lesson, they need to revise more. Plan and prepare to revise. You've got all the rest of the information there. Timing. If we were together now, I'd say close your eyes, put your hand up when one minute's gone. And there'd be very few of you that would get bang on one minute. We're not very good at time management. Students, because they're in school and they live to a strict schedule, are much better equipped. But we are not very good at assessing time. So that's another reason why a mock exam is a decent idea, because it lets them see that they have got time to read the question and read it again. They have got time to go back and look and check. They will have time. And so the only way that they can really learn that is through a mock exam. Make sure they understand they've got that planning, that reading time. Make sure they read the old question. How many times when you've been doing these quick quizzes and these tests, how many times have you misread the question? Make sure you read the question. Use their experiences to help them understand how to be successful. The key vocabulary again, we know now not to define the key vocab for a subject area. But they do need to understand what these words, this vocabulary that's used extensively in assessments and exams, they need to understand what they actually mean so that they can access the question and they can answer it appropriately. Right, whizzing through. Top tips, some important words are in capitals, some are in italics. Remind them, if their revision schedule is not working, don't throw it away. Change it. It's okay to change it, but don't scrap it. Look at this, we're gonna finish bang on time, how good are we? Be happy. Confidence is a result of knowing you're prepared. So be happy, be confident, be prepared. That's the key thing to revision. Don't leave it to the last minute. Make sure you are allowing them to access as many different techniques and strategies that you possibly can. The one that you think is a bit boring or rubbish, they surprise you. And they'll look at it and go, this is a great idea, miss. I really enjoyed drawing that or doodling on that concept map. And you can't believe it. But at the end of the day, if it works for them, that's absolutely fantastic. But... What we need to do is make sure that we've given them so many different strategies, we've taught them different strategies so that they can choose the one that works for them. I always go bright red at this point, have you noticed? Um, so there's all the information that you could possibly need about us. And if you need any information, if there's anything I can do to support you, then please let us know. There's a brilliant team there at Macmillan that just want everyone to do well and support as best we can. So thank you so much for being so interactive and engaging in this session. I really do appreciate that. And I'm so pleased that some of you are telling me that the tips are useful. That's what it's all about. I hope they are. I hope you are successful, your students are successful. And so I guess it's over to Macmillan to end this session. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Debbie. I think we can all agree that that was absolutely fantastic. I definitely learned loads throughout the session. And like Debbie said, if you have any questions afterwards, you can email us at Caribbean at um, And you can also find us on the various social channels as well. Um, you will all be emailed a copy of the PowerPoint afterwards and a certificate. Um, but yeah, any other questions, just let us know. And once again, thank you so much, Debbie. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.